Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Meshlove. Today we'll be exploring animal communication. With me is veterinary medicine doctor Carlene Stange from Durango, Colorado, who is the author of the book, The Spiritual Nature of Animals. A country vet explores the wisdom, compassion, and souls of animals. Welcome, Carlene. Thank you, Jeffrey. It's really a pleasure to be here and to get to know you and join the esteemed group of people you've interviewed. Well, it's a pleasure to be with you. You did something uh, unusual, I think, for a veterinary doctor. You studied animal communication with an animal communicator, by which I presume you mean a clairvoyant. Yes, a professional animal communicator. That's how she makes her living. Mm -hmm. Her name is Kate Celisti. So with each of the chapters in my book, I wanted to give a genuine review of what they really believe. So I, I practiced each of the religions. I practiced Buddhism and, you know, I chanted mantras for the Hinduism and so on. Mm -hmm. And so I, I really was skeptical about animal communication. I, I did not believe it. And so I, I wanted to present a genuine view of it. So I decided I better just do an apprenticeship yeah. with Kate, who was recommended to me. And uh, lo and behold, uh, I discovered that we do it all the time. Uh -huh. You were already doing it. Already doing it. I mean, uh -huh. all veterinarians are animal communicators because uh -huh. we don't have the option of asking the cat, you know, how do you feel or dog, what's wrong? Mm -hmm. You know, what did you eat? Yeah. You know, uh, they're, <laughs> they're always getting in trouble eating things. You wish you could ask them and they'd tell you. Yeah. But um, yeah, we... So I did it, and uh, people communicate well with animals all the time. You're, you ask your dog, you know, do you want to go out? You know, and the dog goes, yeah, I want to go out. Or, <laughs> you know, are you hungry? What? You know, yeah. people do it all the time. Mm -hmm. But veterinarians, we don't have carte blanche to just run every test. We can't just go do an MRI. So we have to uh, use our other senses, mm -hmm. you know. So we, the flick of a tail, the set of the ears, you know, the look in the eyes, vocalizations, and we palpate. We feel everything for a flinch to a touch, you know, and then we use our intuition mm -hmm. for lack or guess. So, you know, our best scientific guess, our educated guess yeah. as to where to go next with diagnostics or medications because we, we can't just run every test and make a diagnosis. We have to sort of guess. So I think we start to pick up over the years, you get clues. One day I walked in the back door of the animal hospital and there was a yellow lab laying on the floor and it was laying there like this and it looked up at me and went, ah! And I said, I think this dog needs to pee. Yeah. And everybody was busy. Everybody was yeah. busy with other animals. And they said, we know we're all busy. I said, I'll help. So yeah. the dog was paralyzed. Oh. And so we took it out and the bladder was huge and it was also paralyzed and couldn't express it. So oh. took it back in and, uh, catheterized the, the other vet there, catheterized the, so it had jumped an irrigation ditch and mm. missed and hit his neck. Oh. Sorry. And, um, so I, I said, do you want me to do acupuncture on the dog? They said, well, uh, they're going to euthanize him. I said, well, I got a few time, I got a few minutes, you know, I'll just do some acupuncture. And if they euthanize him, don't charge him. But if they want to continue, let me know. Mm -hmm. So I, I treated everything. I figured you had a, he had a neck injury because everything but his right front was paralyzed. Mm. And, um, so I, by, the, by the time I got home, the people had called me and said, please treat him again. He's doing better. He yeah. could urinate on his own now, which is huge. That's mm -hmm. a big deal. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and so, uh, after I, they came in a few days later and I treated him again and, uh, I said, let's see if he can stand. Not only could he stand, he could walk. They held him by the chest and the man went out the, the door going, it's a miracle, it's a miracle. And yay for acupuncture. But my point is, the dog is the human communicator. With one, eh, mm -hmm. the dog told me I got to pee. You know, I knew it. Mm -hmm. And he, he told me. So dog speak, cat, dog, horse, fox. You know, they communicate with all kinds of animals. They speak multi-languages, mm -hmm. right? The Schutzen trained dogs speak German or Czechoslovakian or 
Schutzen training. Yeah. It's a it's a, a attack dog I see. commands, and they don't uh -huh. want just anybody to command their dog, so they use it in a. In other words, the dog is learning certain commands that are spoken in particular languages. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my karate teacher used Japanese Okinawan commands yeah. for his dog, pit bull. Well, I would imagine for a uh, a human. Uh, person, any person, to communicate with an animal. It's not so different than uh, a, a mother communicating with the baby. Right. Oh, that's a good example. Mm -hmm. For sure, they understand intuitively what's going on. I find it really entertaining uh, because the personality comes through. Mm -hmm. I remember uh, this two-year-old German Shepherd neutered male, and uh, I said, how are you? Fine. He kept looking at the door. Like, what'd you do today? Nothing. You know, he kept looking at the door like, can I go now? Like a teenage boy. You know, it's just like, can I get out of here now? Uh -huh. Don't bother me. And then this golden doodle, I could barely get the question out. And he would be just babbling on with answers. Mm. And I always kind of doubt myself. Am I really getting the right information? But I always ask at the end, is there something you want to say to your mom, your person? And he said, I love her, love her, love her, love her, love her. And so I told her that. She said, Oh my gosh, that's what I always say to him. Oh. And so I didn't know that. And so uh -huh. over and over and over again, I've been, you know, validated that yes, you mm -hmm. are getting information that you didn't know that the animal is sharing with you. Well, uh, how did this particular teacher uh, instruct you? Uh, you get into a meditative state mm -hmm. and, you know, stop thinking. You know, the, and again, the animals don't have the prefrontal cortex. And if you can stop that, and open your heart mm -hmm. to feeling, and you make a, a light channel. You might also initially... Uh, when you say a light channel... Yeah, you visualize a channel of light between your heart uh -huh. and the animal's heart. And you might also envelop yourself in light or do some kind of invocation of safety mm -hmm. and love. You know, mm -hmm. there's all kinds of energies, right? Yeah. So you want to, you know, say a little prayer. The clairvoyant that always interviewed me, she said, you know, may this be for our highest good and entertainment or mm -hmm. something like that. And so I always say a little prayer, you know, protect us and guide us to have a genuine communication and uh -huh. um and then you start out with some gentle questions like you know what did you eat today or uh how's your leg feeling since last week or you know just something mm -hmm. gentle until you warm up mm -hmm. so uh, i first learned to do it reading a book also i was reading a book by amelia kincaid and um she i was doing it on a on a computer photo of a dog oh. and the woman had come to me because the dog um she had gone to a festival and when she came home that she said hi to the dog and then she went to the grocery store and when she came back the dog had eaten the molding off the door Ooh. and she wondered what was going on you know what scared the dog why was this dog acting this way she was a gentle spayed female nice little girl why was she doing this and so i i asked her some questions you know um how you know how often do you go for a walk you know every day okay and uh what do you eat what do you like to eat she's chicken not fish i had recommended fish earlier uh -huh. and she's like chicken not fish i'm like <laughs> what's your favorite toy and she told me it was this rope mm -hmm. and um and i said you know why did you you know are you afraid of something what scared you that you had to eat the molding off the off the door she said I'm not afraid. I'm bored and lonely, mm -hmm. which felt awful. Yeah. And Amelia Kincaid suggested that if you get an emotion that you should feel it, you mm -hmm. know, empathize with the animal, which I did. And it felt awful yeah. to be so bored and lonely that I would eat the molding off the door. Just to pass the time. Huh? Just for frustration, uh -huh. from being insane, from nothing to do. Yeah. I mean, these animals have brains and mm -hmm. they, they're they bored, right? And so I told the lady, I asked him, you know, do you have any other dogs? Do you have any friends? Do you like other dogs? They said, I like little dogs. Mm -hmm. Do you like cats? No. Hmm. You know, <laughs> so when the woman came back in the room, I asked her, I go, you know, does the dog like dogs? Yeah, it likes little dogs, you know, mm -hmm. does he like cats? No, he's afraid of cats. Mm -hmm. And um, I said, how much exercise does the dog get? You know, 30 minutes once a day. 
And, and then she goes away and leaves the dog locked in the house. Oh. I said, this is not a stereo system that you can turn off. Yeah. Speaking of the zombie and, and the machine of the animal, it's mm -hmm. not. Mm -hmm. It's an animal with a mind and feelings, and it's bored. The dog is bored and lonely, you know. Could you get in another dog? I mean, you wouldn't leave a child uh, alone all day, I suppose. Well, and, some people do, but yeah, yeah that's not advisable. But I, I gather that lots of times the, the pets that you communicate with are kind of like like children. Uh-huh. I mean, they, they assume that role in the family. Yeah. Or sometimes they're the adult. <laughs> <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. depending on the individual. But I, I, I told the woman, you know, you need to give this dog more exercise. The dog said it wanted to go for a walk in the woods. We never do that anymore. And, you know, it, she, that wasn't going to happen. Uh -huh. They weren't going to get another dog. But she did start taking it to da animal daycare. Mm -hmm. And the dog would come home so exhausted, and they ended up getting another dog. Mm. And so um, the behavior stopped. Uh, it's, 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 and I, you know, I talked to my clairvoyant who reads me, mm -hmm. and she said, that's why I never practice empathy. Uh, this clairsentience. I never practice that because you feel the other animal's pain or the other yeah, person's pain. She right. Says, I got enough pain. I don't need that. <laughs> oh, <laughs> right? I, I right? see. And so I, I try not to do that. Mm -hmm. One of the most interesting animal communications I had was a dog that um, he was waking up out of his bed and looking really scared and getting up and going over and sitting somewhere else and looking really afraid. And, and they couldn't figure out what was wrong. And he would do it multiple times a day and night. And uh, so I said, send me some photos. So they sent me three photos. One was him on a walk, a hike with another dog, and he mm -hmm. was all happy. And the other one was him in the backyard, all guard dog. And then there was this picture of him like this. So I communicated with that that picture. Now, now, let me understand this properly. The photos came from the owner? Yes, she mm -hmm. sent them on email. Uh -huh. I open them up. I, I make my connection with the animal. Yeah. I want to see the eyes. Mm -hmm. The eyes have to so be looking straight ahead. So the animal is not physically with you? Correct. And All you I, have are the photos. And I can do it with the people, but the people are there mm -hmm. then. Yeah. You know, And sometimes that's okay if they check out a little bit. Yeah. But otherwise, they kind of get in the way sometimes energetically mm -hmm. for me. Yeah. Other people are much more experienced at it than yeah. I am. So I like to do it. Well, the course you took ran how long? I just did two months, and it was over the phone. I see. Mm -hmm. And how did you progress during that time? Um, did you find well, like you just right away realized you were already doing it anyway? No, the first thing is you communicate with your own animals, uh -huh. which is really problematic because you have a lot of emotions and yeah. worries and concerns and agendas already projected out there. Mm -hmm. So you have to learn to stop that. Mm -hmm. You have to stop your thinking and just go with the feeling and mm -hmm. and and connecting with heart mm. and asking and then listening. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the problems I had that she pointed out is you're always trying to fix everything and you're more doing it for the client's perspective rather than the animal's perspective. You need to be the advocate for the animal and tell the people, straighten up, here's what's happening with the animal rather yeah. and then the animal will trust you mm -hmm. and say, I'm your advocate, I'm speaking for you. Mm -hmm. But I, I get hung up because they come with veterinary problems and the client has a problem and I'm trying to mediate between the two. Yeah. So that that is my issue. But when you communicate with the animal, are you thinking in words? I hear words. Mm -hmm. I, I'm more clairaudient yeah. than I do get some pictures uh, sometimes. And um, I get clair, uh, clair salience, I guess it is, where you have odors, oh. you smell odors occasionally. Mm -hmm. I had one dog that um, it had um, eosinophilic uh, pneumonopathy. It was a, a like severe allergic reaction uh -huh. in the lungs, oh. a lot of nasal discharge, and it was an Akita, a beautiful dog. And I got this disgusting odor. Mm. Um, it was like a, a combination of garbage and and feces and, you know, uh -huh. just bad. Yeah. It turns out they found pack rat nests under her pantry, under her bathtub. Oh. It was an old house. And now dogs smell parts per billion, right? Yes. So you can imagine the olfaction that affronts them yeah. all the time. And I'm so under I the impression, though, that dogs often like odors that humans would not like. 
yeah, they're attracted to things that, yeah, they'll eat anything, mm -hmm. especially if it reeks. Mm -hmm. So, uh, But yeah. in this case, the dog was I trying to let you know it, it didn't and, like that. Well, order. I just, when I started talking to it, I got this uh -huh. smell. Is it, it, that would be normal because smell is such a large part of the canine consciousness exactly. that, that if they want to communicate with you to send you a smell would mm. make a lot of sense. Right, right, good point. Me. Logical. Good point, I hadn't thought of that. Yeah. Right, and occasionally I'll get an image. Um, again, I, I had a very odd one with this dog and I was talking on the computer. I like to do it at night uh -huh. when I'm rested and it's all quiet and yeah. I can it takes a lot of concentration I would really think. Yeah. for me. And um I I said, you know, what what's going on? Why are you so afraid? And he said, There's mean people in my house. And I knew the owners and they were very nice people and I and he said they're everywhere and they poke me. And I said, Does anybody else see these people? He said, the cat does, but they don't bother her. Mm. And I, I said, do the husband and wife see them, these people? No, but they're everywhere they're in. They come in the windows and the doors, and they're in the basement. And I was like, uh-oh, this is an area not where I have been before. Yeah, that sounds like a psychotic <laughs> animal. <laughs> well, it was a rescue from the uh -huh. Navajo Reservation. Mm -hmm. So I don't know now, is the house haunted? Is the dog haunted? What's going on here? Yeah. But I just told the people, here's what the dog said. Mm. And they, he told me to tell you they're in your bedroom and <laughs> I leave it at that. So they got a, yeah. a person to come, a shaman to come and create a vortex to clear the house of these demons uh -huh. or these entities. ghosts, entities. Yeah. Yeah. And then they had their priest come and bless their house and the behavior has completely stopped. Well, how interesting. It was, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so I think it's, I definitely believe it is a valid and really helpful, mm -hmm. helpful thing. And you started out pretty skeptical. Totally skeptical. But one thing I, I did relate to was how animals sense our energy. And I think animals sense the energy of other beings. Now, the story of Balaam's ass in <laughs> Numbers 22, yes. right? That is a great story because, um, shall I tell the story? Yes, okay. yes, it's a fascinating story. All right, it's the best story in the whole Bible. <laughs> <laughs> so Balaam was a prophet, mm -hmm. and at that time the Israelites had left Egypt for the Promised Land, mm -hmm. and there were thousands of them, and they camped in the land of Moab, mm -hmm. and the Moabites were upset by their presence because there's so many of them, mm -hmm. and so they hired the prophet Balaam to curse the Israelites. So Balaam got on his donkey, and he headed out to do the job. But God didn't want Balaam to curse the Israelites, so he placed an angel with a sword in Balaam's path. Mm. But Balaam didn't see it, but the donkey did, and she turned away. Uh -huh. And Balaam smacked her. So now he tried a second round along the wall, and when the donkey saw the angel with the sword, she scraped Balaam's leg against the wall, and it hurt him, and he hit her again. Mm. So he tried a third route where the ass couldn't turn right or left. But when she saw that angel, she just laid down, and Balaam whacked her a third time. Then the Lord opened the donkey's mouth, and she spoke, saying, Why have you struck me these three times? Aren't I your good ass? You've ridden your whole life. Have you ever known me to act that way? And Balaam was so angry. And then the Lord opened Balaam's eyes, and he saw the angel who spoke, saying, just now, I was going to spare your ass and smite you for disobeying God. <laughs> so it brings up an interesting yes. thing in that um, here is a being that's not supposed to have a spirit who can see a spirit. Mm -hmm. How can a being without a spirit see a spiritual being? Better than the prophet who channels God. Well, Tibetan Buddhists, uh, a monk I met at the... Uh, Monastery of Christ in the Desert in Abiquiu, New Mexico. Mm -hmm. He said, absolutely. There's an angel in front of the monastery, and whenever I ride my horses by there, the horses always shy away. Oh. They definitely see spirit. Shamans say that. Uh, a Lama, Tibetan Lama, I did a workshop with. He said, animals see spirit realm better than people do. So I, whenever you see, so the moral of this story <laughs> yeah. is for me, if an animal you know well acts strange, strangely about something, Rather than getting angry, pay attention mm -hmm. because they know what's going on. So I think they do see spirit realm better and they also sense 
energy better than we do. We're always cognating about everything. Yeah. And so they, they feel, you know, they love love. They're attracted to you, you know? They, they run. I love it because now that, now that I just do acupuncture, the animals love to come to my office. Uh -huh. You know, they get cookies and the opium is released during acupuncture. It makes them feel good. Mm -hmm. So they love to come where a lot of times they're scared at the veterinary clinic. Maybe if they've never even been there, they can smell it. You know, they just <laughs> sense it. I ain't going in there. It's frightening to them. Mm -hmm. So I think we need to pay attention to that with the animals that they sense our energy. Veterinarians have to do it. If a dog tries to bite me, the next three dogs I meet will try to bite me because I'm afraid. Oh. I'm, I'm projecting. And with horses, you have to be, you know, horses, yes. I'm Being a horse doctor, mm -hmm. was I afraid of horses? Absolutely. Oh, they big animals. I mean, a, a horse can really hurt a human. Yeah. And I don't know this horse. It's a new horse every day, right? Mm -hmm. And somehow I have to let them know I'm not a bad person. And, but I also have to not be afraid. They'll always, a lot of times they'll test you. Mm -hmm. Like if I go to pick up a hoof, they'll try to step on my foot. I know. We just go quit. And they go, okay. <laughs> yeah, they do. They're like, I right, can't fool her. But you have to kind of project that energy of, I'm your friend. I'm okay. I'm going to do what I'm going to do. I'm not going to hurt, you know. Mm -hmm. And otherwise it is more dangerous. Yeah. So thankfully, we have to learn that mm -hmm. early on in veterinary medicine. You know, I had an experience once, and it was a theatrical experience uh, where I, I was performing in a play, and I played a wizard, and the theater director uh, had managed to um, acquire a red-tailed hawk oh. with a trainer. Yeah. So they yeah, said, we'd like you to walk out on stage carrying the red-tailed hawk on your arm. And I said, well, okay, fine. And um, I got along very well with this hawk, as a matter of fact. It was no problem uh, whatsoever. The hawk was very calm, and uh, it worked out well. And I walk out on stage, and the hawk has got his wings extended. Oh, nice. So it was a really beautiful scene. Uh... Afterwards, the trainer said to me, he said, why, well, you're very lucky. He said, that hawk put his talon through somebody's hand just two days ago. <laughs> yeah. Nobody had warned me. <laughs> Horses are really good about that with children. Mm -hmm. You know, they, uh, my horse, Pecos, loved to run. Yeah. And the only trouble I ever had with him is trying to make him walk mm -hmm. when he wants to go faster than that, yeah. you know. But I'd put a little child on him, and uh -huh. he would be an angel. He'd walk slowly, yeah. you know, and I've heard that from other people where, you know, children can walk under the horse, play with the horse, and yet they'll bite a person, an adult. Well, the same thing, uh, the trainer with the red-tailed hawk told me there was a like a two-year-old girl who, who lived uh, in, at the house where the trainer was, and uh, this girl would come up and play with the hawk all the time. There was uh -huh. never any... Uh, right, um, right. And the animals sense that. Uh -huh. They just feel us, and they know if we're okay or not. So I think we need to pay attention to that when we're interacting with the animals more in general, you know, and they're always trying to help us when our energy is wacko, mm -hmm. you know, like you're sitting at the computer, you can't remember a password, and you're getting more and more tense. Who shows up? The cat walks across the keyboard, or the dog comes <laughs> and is whining, eh, eh, pet me, pet me, pet me, you know, uh -huh. play ball, let's play ball. You're like, get out of here. No, we need to stop. Mm. They're trying to tell you, lady. Take a break. You know, <laughs> pet me. You need help. They're trying to help us, uh -huh. right? Yeah. Okay, so just t stop for a minute. Pet the dog. Go play the ball. Go for a walk. Pet the cat. Take a moment. You'll come back and be. You'll remember your password. You'll be. You'll be better. And it's they as if they know that that's their function, right? And the channel Abraham says the primary purpose for beasts on this planet is to balance our energy. Mm -hmm. In other words, we need a lot of help. So. Well, I, it would seem that uh, one of the you know, byproducts of civilization is that we get out of balance. Mm -hmm. Right, right. And they help us. You know, they're little pure positive energy mm -hmm. taps because they live in the present moment. They don't worry about the past. They don't anticipate awful things in the future. They just are in the present moment, mm -hmm. here and now. So in your training, um, it went through various stages as as you progressed, I suppose, over two months. Mm -hmm. 
yeah, learning to communicate with my own animals was mm-hmm. the hardest. Yeah. And, and um, from there, it just was easy, except for the concentration part uh-huh. and, and keeping the people out of the way. Yeah. I, I had an actual animal communicator bring her dog to me one time because uh, the dog was lame in the hind end. Mm. And she would never let anybody touch her hind end. So how am I supposed to figure out what's going on? I couldn't feel her pulses. I couldn't palpate her. And um, she was 15 years old mm. at the time. And and just apparently she had some kind of abuse in the former owner and mm-hmm. that's why no one could ever touch her back yeah. there and so i just she was had a halter a harness on and i just communicated with her silently you know you're 15 years old that happened a long time ago and that's one of the things my uh, apprenticeship taught me is mm-hmm. if you know they'll let go of something if you remind them mm-hmm. that's that's old stuff that's done yeah. it's gone now mm-hmm. you can let it go and so I said, you know, this lady, she's never going to let anything like that ever happen to you again. You know, so why not just let it go? Why not just forget about it and mm-hmm. let me touch you back there? You mm-hmm. know, and I, I said, what's the worst thing that could happen? You know, you could die. You're 15. You know, mm-hmm. you're pretty soon you're going to go. And the dog sat on my knee. And I, I was able to reach over and feel her pulse. Mm-hmm. And I went down and found out she had a big arthritic knee. Oh. Big stifle arthritis. Mm-hmm. So it was, you know, she let it go. Uh huh. Well, that's interesting. But you, are you communicating in words? Because earlier you indicated to me the animals are not uh, using words, they use pictures. They, bo- all of the above. Uh-huh. So there's clairaudience, clairsentience, yeah. clairalliance clairvoyance Uh and so some people are more skilled at one than the other and i i generally hear but occasionally see an image Mm -hmm. or feel something or or have a fragrance but the you know it's spirit language is what it is and so the spirit language is translated through my translators Mm -hmm. so i use my words to translate their message but, and when you are projecting a thought to them, you're... Mm-hmm. you're I'm speaking words in my head. Uh-huh. That's how I do it. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah. And they somehow are able to sense your meaning. Yes. They understand. Mm-hmm. They seem to. Yeah. Because they respond. Seem to be. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. I feel, I feel like they are. I mean, the clients tell me, yes. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the, the most animal communicators I know are veterinarians that I've met mm-hmm. at veterinary conferences who mm-hmm. told me secretly yeah. that either they always had that skill and then kind of shoved it away and then they brought it out again or their clients found out that they could do that and now they come for them mm-hmm. specifically to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, and some just don't... Uh, share it with very many people. Well, when I was a child, I loved the Dr. Doolittle books. Uh-huh. And uh, you know, here's a man who seemed to have a natural ability to communicate with every animal, mm-hmm. and he could hear them speak to him. Right. And, uh, it was, it, of course, at the time, I, you know, loved fantasies. <laughs> so, uh, but it, perhaps there is a deeper truth to Dr. Doolittle. Mm, I speak to everything. If a bird uh-huh. flies over, I say, hello, beautiful, because I know they can see me, uh-huh. you know, and, and I feel like I get all these wonderful visitations. I had the most amazing experience in the Bistai Badlands. Have you ever been to the Bistai? It's in Bistai? northern. Bistai. Mm-hmm. It's a Navajo tribal uh, land. It's a park, mm-hmm. and it's um, it's a badlands. No. It looks like just eroded soil. I it's see. It's gray and tan and gray mm-hmm. and maroon, and it's there's no vegetation. Oh, okay? so it's I'm, very different than the badlands of South Dakota. I don't know. I haven't. Yeah. I don't remember. Oh, they're them. full of vegetation. Oh, there's nothing out there. This uh-huh. is and there. I was riding my donkey. She's a little black and white pinto, yeah. and she'll eat anything. And she took a bite of some briar and spit it out. So I don't think there's much edible vegetation <laughs> out there. She would have eaten it. But there's petrified logs mm-hmm. out there, and uh, they found dinosaur skulls out there. It's ancient, ancient, yeah. strange place, right? Yeah. So uh, my friend that I was riding with, there's two other women, 
And uh, she had said, last time I rode out here, I saw a naked man. Hmm. Well, that's interesting. So we're riding along, and they were in front of me. And they turned, and as they did, I saw a man get up from a rock and scurry off. And I saw his naked bottom, and I oh, oh there's a naked man, you know. <laughs> so we go off, and there's these st- tall, steely hoodoos and hard, round rock formations and the petrified wood, of course. And we were, we were sitting there talking, and there's no life. It's August at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, it's 80 degrees, mm-hmm. and we're sitting on our horses talking, and a white owl flew over. Mm-hmm. I said, what was that? That looked like a white owl. My friend said, yeah, it's a white owl. Like, There's no white owl in the Bistai. There, snowy owls breed in the Arctic tundra. <laughs> it's not, yeah. I know birds. Yeah. It's not an, it's not an aw, mm-hmm. a hawk. You know, it's not a barn owl. Well, what is this? And so we had to talk. Now, Navajos believe that um, the owl is a bad omen, calls mm-hmm. death. Uh-huh. Fortunately, it was silent. Mm-hmm. We decided, no, it's white. Mm-hmm. It's a good omen. So yeah. we're like, what could this be? Could That naked man could be a shaman. Because yeah. this is a place they might come out to do some kind of ceremony. Mm-hmm. Maybe he's a shapeshifter, and that was him. We kind of settled with that. <laughs> but but yeah. for me, it just it was spirit. Mm-hmm. You know, the spirit animals are white. Mm-hmm. And so uh, I had that uh, visitation, like spirit is everywhere. Mm-hmm. Even where there's no life, here is spirit. Yeah. So that's what I took away from it. I had another owl encounter where the moment the I received the message that my mother died. It was December 3rd, like 6 a.m. And when I hung up the phone, I heard owl hooting outside my window. Mm. And I opened the blind, and here's this owl. And I just felt like it was my mother. I go, hi, Mom. You know, and it, it's such a haunting sound, that hoo-hoo, yes, hoo-hoo. Uh-huh. You know, and so I talked with her for a while and thanked her. And, and, this, and the sun started to rise up in the east, and she flew off into the sunrise. And I have had so many people tell me that birds appeared to them. You know, the red cardinal is uh, one that a lot of people say will appear as a loved one. Mm-hmm. And a number of people have told me that their loved ones appeared as birds after they died. Well, there's quite a lore uh, in the UFO community regarding owls. That, is there? Yes, the idea is that the aliens, knowing that we might be frightened by you know, their actual presence, mm-hmm. uh, will assume the form of, a, of an owl. And mm-hmm. that is a common theme among other teachings as well, that mm-hmm. great spiritual masters will take the form of an animal mm-hmm. t- for a particular purpose. Yeah. And so, yeah, you never know what you're looking at. What kind of, is it really an animal? Mm. Is it a spirit animal? Is it a spirit in animal form? Is it an alien? Is it? Well, I would think if you've established some uh, ability to communicate with animals telepathically, that uh, you would be able to uh, use that same ability uh, with a spirit animal. Yes. Yes. And it's like talking to spirit. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, and that's one of the things I also learned in the process of writing this book. Yes. Because many of the teachers are saying, you know, you have this Buddha nature, God within you, inner being, higher conscience, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. And for me, that is this um, brutally honest, unconditionally loving voice. So here, here's a trite example I like to use is my hand is in a bag of potato chips. And I hear, that's enough. Mm -hmm. Do I listen or do I argue? (laughs) Uh, Just 10 more. That's 10. Yeah. Okay. And more and more I listen because Mm -hmm. this is like the animals. It's trying to help me. Yeah. It's trying to teach me. And (laughs) I think I told you about my uh, episode with the I Ching. I asked the I Ching a question. Mm Mm-hmm. The Book of Changes yeah. and the, the Chinese book of uh, basically fortune telling. Yes, but it's more than that. Mm-hmm. It's um, you know both both Confucianism and Taoism. Yes, it's uh, ancient and and it doesn't tell the future. It tells the present. Mm-hmm. And so you ask a question, it tells you here's what's happening right These now. These are the influences operating at the moment. Right. Uh huh. Yes, and Carl Jung wrote the uh, yes. introduction to uh, an edition of the I Ching. He did. Mm-hmm. And so 
I asked it a question and it gave me the answer and it said, but all this good advice is wasted on you because you're so obstinate you won't take it. Oh. And I had to laugh because it felt very true. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've time. probably changed a bit since then. I have. So those yeah. kind of messages, mm -hmm. I just learned to surrender, accept, mm -hmm. and trust yeah. way more than I ever used to, which mm -hmm. has helped me a great deal. Yeah. In your work as a vet, I presume you're dealing almost exclusively with domesticated animals. Well, the Durango Animal Hospital treats wildlife for free. Mm -hmm. So it's a really fun place. You walk in there, like one day I walked in there and here comes a peregrine falcon oh. on Dr. Haman's arm. And I, I said, you are holding the world's fastest creature. Oh. Yeah. He said, they're amazing. Uh -huh. You know, they're, and it had a broken wing. Mm -hmm. It had broken the radius and ulna. Uh -huh. So he had planned to send it to a flight cage over in, uh, South Fork where they oh. you know, rehab the oh birds uh -huh. and then teach them how to fly again oh. before they release them. Uh -huh. Yeah. So veterinarians are doing a lot of this work pro bono. Yes, if you don't belong to a corporation, because mm -hmm. they won't let you, yeah. which is why he hasn't sold to a corporation. He wants to do wildlife for free. Mm -hmm. And he is a falconer, so yeah. he has dealt with a lot of falcons. But anything, you know, any kind of wild animal has been brought. And they also have a relationship with the DOW, so that the DOW can bring an animal in. So What is that? D Division of Wildlife. Ah. The Division of Wildlife will have an animal. Or, you know, often, like, people call me and say, I found a fawn. Mm -hmm. And I want to, and like, don't. Touch the fawn. Leave it. Mom went to Walmart shopping. She left the baby in the crib, and now you're stealing it. Yeah. And now your scent is on it. Mm. You're wrecking it. Mm. Leave it. People always think they're going to fix things by mm -hmm. intervening. Leave it. Mm -hmm. Let it be. Nature has a better way of doing with it. If, unless you've mangled it and it needs help, okay, mm -hmm. Hopefully the DOW, call the DOW, the Division of Wildlife. They'll uh -huh. take care of it and then they take it to the animal hospital if someone will take care of the animals. But I've seen all kinds of things in there, foxes and definitely owls and mountain lion cubs and uh -huh. you know, beautiful, wonderful wildlife. And do you find that the, this animal communication works with the domesticated as well as the wild? Definitely. Uh -huh. I mean, I, I don't, I was talking to a tree one day. Too, a big yeah. cottonwood tree. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it, it told me it chose to be a tree for 600 years or whatever. It was, uh, you know, just sit here and watch everything go by in the blink of an eye. You know, mm -hmm. I had this lovely conversation. Maybe I was making it up in my mind. I don't know, but I had a good time. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, and that's one of the uh, issues when you do this work is, is that there's always, I suppose, a possibility you can be fooling yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I always leave that as a possibility. But then I, I am always, I'm validated so often more and more mm -hmm. that I just let it be and I don't judge myself. Yeah. That is the number one thing I learned in the process of writing this book. Mm -hmm. I, I met a clairvoyant and I wanted to interview her for my book and I told her how badly I felt about w when my patients didn't get better and she laughed. And then she laughed yeah. some more. Uh -huh. And she laughed until she cried and nearly <laughs> fell off her chair. And I felt offended. I said, yeah. well, I'm glad I can be a source of entertainment for you. She said, I'm sorry, but it's not your fault if an animal mm -hmm. doesn't get better. Yeah. I said, well, what do people hire me for? She said, well, you help for sure, but there's a lot more going on than just what you do. Mm -hmm. Maybe the animal had other plans. Yeah. Maybe the people and the animal are trying to learn something together. And then she said, don't judge the situation. Judgment is pain. And, you know, I thought she was nuts at the time, but I started to take what she said to heart and realize how egotistical it is of me to think that I can heal every animal. And, and I started realizing that whenever I judged something or someone, I felt pain and they judged me. Mm -hmm. And I started realizing, you know, take politics. That's a great way to pla practice. Think about something that really bugs you. No, there's plenty when right. it comes to politics. Right. And so where do you feel the tension in your body? When you, Is it your neck, your head, your stomach, your back, your knees? What? Mm -hmm. And so I started to correlate the two and go, okay, oof, I don't really need the pain. Yeah. I'll just let it go. I'll try to find something good in that. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was a huge lesson for me. And of course, many of the spiritual teachers say the same thing. Mm -hmm. Eckhart Tolle, uh, uh, Thich Nhat Hanh said, Relief, release, release judgment and pain disappears. And Jesus, of course, said, judge not. Yep. For the judgment you give is the judgment you get. Mm -hmm. 
So uh, that has helped me a great deal in practice, not carry away the pain of what I see all day, mm-hmm. because maybe there's stuff going on that I don't know about. Like, let's in talk fact, about, almost inevitably. Definitely. What do I know? <laughs> Nothing. Let's look at Cecil the Lion. Do you remember Cecil the Lion? See, who was an African lion. Right. He yes. was in a preserve in Kenya. Yes, and, and was shot by a hunter. Yeah, a dentist mm-hmm. from Minnesota. Oh, yes. And um, He was then vilified. Very much so. The yeah. Oxford, Oxford, I think, scientists were monitoring Cecil, yeah. so they kept track of him. But this hunter hired some safari to lure him, to lure him out of the park, yeah. and he shot him. Yeah, and then it, you know because the Oxford scientists knew about it, yeah. it went viral, yes. and everybody wanted to kill mm-hmm. that dentist. Yeah, so he got the opportunity to feel what it's like to be hunted. Mm-hmm. He couldn't go back to work for months. Yes, right, mm-hmm. and then money poured in for protection of lions, mm-hmm. and. Um, I think it's England, Netherlands, and France no longer accept trophy lions or life lion trophies into uh, the country. Oh. And a number of airlines refused to transport trophies of any kind. Mm-hmm. And trophy hunting took a digger worldwide. Yeah. Uh-huh. Now, Cecil was 13 years old. In the wild, lions only live to be 10 to 14 years. Yeah. So here he is at the end of his life. So if he had a plan from higher perspective, or if spirit says, Cecil. How would you like to do something? All these beings are crying out for help from these unethical trophy hunters. How, you know, would you like to help out? Mm -hmm. How would you like to offer yourself as this trophy Uh and change the world? That's a scenario. It is mm -hmm. one possibility. So he's at the end of his life. He says, yeah, take Mm me. I'll do it. Mm -hmm. So um, I think there's more going on. You have... Uh, in your book, you report that uh, animal communicators universally notice that animals are willingly sacrificing themselves uh, for the benefit of humans. Right, right. Some for vivisection of all things. This one, uh-huh. there was a group of animal communicators who ta- tackled that issue, mm-hmm. and they were quite surprised. They were, I think, from England. Um, and uh, this group of pigs who was used for some kind of um, joint surgery, prosthesis or uh-huh. something, yeah. and they felt very honored to be part of this important project. And when they died, when they were euthanized after the surgery, they'd reincarnate back in. Mm. And so, um, you know, other people say this is horrible, all vivisection is bad karma, which may be. And I imagine there's a number of scenarios, again, where perhaps some animals volunteer and some do not. Maybe that's their bad karma. Yeah. I, I don't know. But um, And also for food. Some animals say, you know, I am on a spiritual journey as well, like we talked about with the Jataka tales, mm-hmm. right? You sacrifice yourself for food for another animal. One animal does for another animal as a way of recycling itself and offering itself as a path of spiritual growth. And that's what some of these animals said to these animal communicators that I am on my path for spiritual growth as well. I'm learning my lessons. Mm-hmm. You know, I choose to do this. Yeah. If we have plans from higher perspective, then we're here in these ways. And so all is well. You know, then we don't have to be. It so should concerned. be understandable. I mean, this is what we ask of our military. I mean it. Exactly. And they volunteer. Yeah. And they would, many of them would rather die in battle for a righteous cause than in some old people's home or mm. a hospital. And, you know, as an old person, they want to do battle. They're honored to sacrifice themselves for this cause. Humans. Yeah. yeah. So all yeah. beings, yeah. perhaps. I'll, I'll, although as a pacifist myself, I, will, <laughs> I wonder if that's such a good idea, and I wonder how much of it is a result of social conditioning. But your point is simply you know, not to judge. Don't judge it, and maybe that's the path they're on, but yeah. they need to learn. Yeah. Maybe they need to learn about war is mm-hmm. of no value. Mm-hmm. Maybe they need to get that perspective. They, like the hunter needed to get the perspective of being hunted so he could learn that. Yeah. 
Well, Carleen Stange, this has been a delightful conversation, and I know we're planning one more. We're going to look at something with which you've had enormous experience, the moment of death, the mm -hmm. sacred moment of death. So I uh, encourage our viewers to check the program listings uh, for our next interview. And thank you so much for being with me, thank Carleen. Thank you, Jeffrey. My pleasure. And thank you for being with us. Thank you.